Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtual launch party. The pandemic year has been very hard in lots of respects, and it's required learning a lot of new things. But this new thing is particularly good because here I am in Dulwich, southeast London, and I am welcoming you from all around the world, which is magical. And I know that there are people joining us from all over the UK, from Ireland, from New York, from Spain. It's absolutely marvellous. So that's one good thing that's come out of the pandemic. Now, I am hosting this launch event tonight with my friend Cheryl from the Chorleywood Bookshop. Hello, Cheryl. Hello. <laughs> and it is our pleasure to welcome our three guests. Um, I'm going to ask Matt Cas Casborn to give away, who, who is the publisher of this book, and he's going to have a chat later. Hi, everyone. And our star of the show, Julia P Perry, who has written this wonderful book about one of our favourite novelists. So it's, it's a double blessing. And Julia is going to be in conversation with Genevieve Fox, who is an author and journalist. <laughs> so on that, I am going to hand over to Julia and Genevieve, who are going to have a, a chat about the book and the wonderful stories behind it. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Well, you can put your questions as we go through on the question board, not on the chat board. And then Genevieve will ask some of those questions at the end. And then Matt is going to say a few words and we are all going to have a celebratory toast to launch this book on its way. <laughs> Genevieve and Julia, over to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, it's really just such an honour to be here. And I understand there are hundreds of you here tonight. So thank you uh, for joining us. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be talking to you, Julia, about your absolutely stunning book. It's a book full of ghosts and echoes. It's a book about women in the 1930s. It's a book about secrets and sex and different kinds of love, cruel, possessive, fond. It's part literary biography, part family memoir, and part travelogue. And it's told zestfully, to use a favourite word of Bones, and now I think, Julia, a favourite word of yours. Absolutely, I stole half my words from her. <laughs> As you know, uh, many of you, the shadowy third hinges on a cache of hitherto unpublished letters between Elizabeth Bowen and her lover, Humphrey House, Julia's grandfather, and letters from Julia's grandmother, Madeline, also. The letters expose the full extent of the affair and show us how Madeline is caught in the middle of it and of their egos and desires and what she does about it. What emerges in Julia's book is an extraordinary story of power and power play and the most powerful character to emerge is not who we might expect, as we'll no doubt hear from Julia uh, shortly. The book's a gripper, but it's very moving too. And I think for me, uh, one of the most moving things about it is the way you come to know your grandfather by, by the end of the book. And I think that's partly because of the traveling you do. Um, the shadowy thorns got is shaped by a very keen sense mm -hmm. of place as of course Bowen's novels and short stories are. And you go back zestfully uh, to the places where Bowen and Humphrey spent um, time together. And your ghost hunting takes you from Oxford to Calcutta to Texas, and of course to the ruins of um, Bowen's court in County Cork in Ireland. And there are some quite eerie happenings along the way to the point where I did think sometimes it was as if Bowen herself had kind of shaped her way into your, uh, sneaked her way rather into your way of sort of thinking and being. Um, before, we, before we talk, I'll just end by saying that you do show Bowen to be, uh, to be vulnerable as well as feisty. But actually on the feisty front, she's certainly not the only one. I mean, the letters are absolutely full of kind of low blows, aren't they? As well as, as well, of course, as sort of high thinking, but some real low blows on the part of this very ferocious threesome. I must say, I can't, I can't recommend it highly enough. So Julia, over yeah. to you. Let's start at the beginning. How did mm -hmm. these letters actually find you? Well, the... The letters found me 
in a very specific way, which I tell right at the beginning of the book. And so what I'd like to do really is to read you that little section about how the letters found me because um, it was a, a really important and sort of life-changing moment about how the letters arrived in my life. Anybody who knows about Bowen's fiction knows she is obsessed with letters. Um, a World of Love, her novel of 1955, hinges on letters arriving in someone's life, as does her brilliant ghost story, The Demon Lover, where letters arrive at the hour arranged. So if you'll let me just read the little bit at the beginning of the book about the letters arriving in my life at the hour arranged, I think that that would give a really um, clear indication and, and maybe a good way of answering that question. So I really just want to read the beginning of the first chapter so that people get a flavor of the book and um, see how the letters in a Bowen-esque way arrive in my life. Okay, can I do that? Yes, Great. Please. Okay. Lovely. The linen was crisp, the light abundant through high stained glass windows. There is a clink of glasses, innuendo and clever chatter. A luncheon party in Oxford in 1933. The host, thick necked and tipping into portliness, eyes the table with satisfaction. His chosen men, bright young fellows of the college, are acquitting themselves well. The woman on his right, intelligent and bold featured, is a superb addition to the group. She, for her part, loves a good meal, particularly if served with wine and virility. There is nothing quite like being the one clever woman in the room. Deftly, she slips impressions of the table up her imaginative sleeve. She's already written a version of her host with his air of cultured complacency into an earlier novel of hers. Further down the table sits a young man, square-faced, taciturn. Here is the Oxford he's been aiming for, yet one he now fears he might lose. Here too, a woman unlike any he has met, spirited, older, other. It is essential to catch her eye, pique her curiosity, be memorable. This was the start of the affair between the brilliant novelist and short story writer Elizabeth Bowen and my grandfather Humphrey House. A story contained in a box of letters that had had for years lain largely forgotten in my uncle John's attic a heart left to beat unheard. Opening the box one afternoon, I was greeted by a chaos of paper of various weights and sizes. Large envelopes, the texture of old skin, bore simply the information EB to HH and HH to EB. I took all the letters and sorted them loosely into piles. The letters from Elizabeth to Humphrey sat on one side of the sofa, his to her on the other. Only then, when I saw them all laid out, did I fully realise our family's good fortune. Unusually, we had ended up with both sides of the correspondence. The whole relationship was there at my fingertips. Elizabeth leapt off the page immediately. Her energy, her breathless handwriting, her imperatives. Stop worrying about your heart and try and have a better brain. I devoured the letters gripped by their brilliance and slightly starstruck by Elizabeth herself. My grandfather, whom I had never met, was a tangible presence for the first time in my life. Five hours flew by and then there was John again, asking if I was ready for a drink. I had tried to line up the letters on the sofa so the back and forth element of the correspondence could be appreciated by the next reader, whoever that might be. My suggestion for reorganization was rejected, kindly but firmly. Back in their separate crepey envelopes they went, into the box and off into the recesses of the house. What impact did the affair have on my family? Why had my grandmother preserved the love letters another woman had written to her husband? Did the relationship spill over into the work of Elizabeth Bowen as family folklore told? All those questions remain unanswered. Six months later, my dear uncle died quite unexpectedly and the tattered old box came to me. Right. So that is, is, is the beginning really, the story of how they arrive. And I do feel that I, I had been um, working as a secondary school English teacher, as many of you know, for about 20 years and I was looking for a challenge. And I felt that these letters were extraordinary 
from both a literary uh, point of literary history, but also family history. And that it was a unique opportunity. I mean, everyone dreams of sort of primary source, unpublished material falling into their lap. And they arrived in my lap and, and um, I started. That was how I started. I think there's so many interesting things in that um, in that opening chapter, and not least that question about why your grandmother kept these love letters, you know, of her husband's, and you explore that so interestingly in the book. The kind of the reveals are very kind of suspenseful. But I wanted to ask you about kind of the letters themselves. I mean, I know they kind of you know, they were part of your family law and they came to you, as you put it. But, you know, letters are quite unfashionable. Mm -hmm. And yet you seem to really relish them. And you talk in the book about how performative Elizabeth Bowen is in the letters. And also, I think your grandfather and you talk about posterity. I wondered, in terms of Eliz Elizabeth Bowen, who do we meet in the letters? Do we meet the real her or do we meet the sort of posterity Bowen, if you like? I think what's so great about the letters is you meet both of them. There is an incredibly raw letter in the middle where she, she, she's actually writing on a train. You know, she's in transit kind of emotionally and literally. And even her, you know, her handwriting is broken and her emotions are really raw for us to see. And then there are other times where she really does perform mm -hmm. to the point where she says things like, you know, I'm expecting you to communicate on a higher plane. Why can't you kind of up your game? Um, and I, but I do think that there was this sort of epistolary discourse that, that um, was expected really and was sort of part of the culture of the day. Um, so they, they did sculpt their letters. They saw them as works of art. And I do think that, that Elizabeth really um, has, I mean, there are some really wonderful passages in it. At the same time, she, she does go on a bit sometimes as well. So I did need to get the scissors out um, because <laughs> some of these letters run to three or 4,000 words and you know, we can't put all of that in the book. Well, mention of scissors um, leads to that um, question of, of the biographer's role, and you've got an unusual role, haven't you, because you're also the granddaughter. And so I wondered, one of the things I wondered actually was, you know, what it was like to write about two people who, who quite frankly, I mean, they're both ambitious, um, which is presumably one of the reasons they were attracted to each other, but they're not always that nice. I mean, Humphrey is described by his friend Isaiah Berlin as my kind of prig in possession of a sort of fascist sternness. And you describe Bowen as naturally secretive and a gifted schemer. I just wondered where the sort of ethics of the biographer fit in here or, or even what the ethics of the biographer are. I mean, it's an interesting one. I think that I think one of the one of the advantages of actually using the letters themselves in allowing them to speak for themselves is that I didn't have to make judgments about their behaviour. They did that brilliantly of themselves, mm -hmm. um, and in a way that freed me up to um, be a, a slightly more detached uh, observer. Obviously, I'm commenting on the action, but their views of one another are given, I hope, in their voices. And that was one of the things I was really aiming for in the book, was, was a biography which, is, which has a sort of polyvocality to it, that there is no one true version, that they all tell their version. And then I tell my version. And of course, my grandmother had a role also in shaping her version. So I really, that, that idea of there not being one true um, definitive story was a very appealing one to me and I think that's why I allowed myself as well to be in the book rather than just telling the story. It's really interesting that because it's quite um, unusual I think you know in a in a in a kind of more more straightforward sort of biography if you like a biographer might talk to different people to get their views and they try to capture the voice of their subject but you have a very rare kind of access and also as you say of two people who because of their passions and because of their fondness for each other um, actually do show these kind of different sides of themselves and when I say uh, I mentioned kind of passion I just wondered whether we could maybe talk about sex for a minute 
um, because I just wondered what was it like learning about your um, grandfather, who was quite vocal, wasn't he, about um, how to put this politely, his sort of, you know, desires and so forth. I think, I think the thing that I, that, you know, I never knew my grandfather. He died when I, you know, my mother was 16. So in a way you're getting to know someone who uh, is, un is unknown. Obviously his attitudes towards women and his behavior towards them was a major challenge. But I think that um, I didn't allow myself to get sort of hung up on that part of his personality because he was a very complex mm. and interesting person. And I think that um, th the attitudes were pretty, nowadays we look at his attitudes to women and think, oh my goodness, pretty awful. But some of that sort of patriarchal assumption of entitlement was very much of his generation. He was a man of his generation. Um, and so I sort of had to unhitch my own feelings of slight um, uneasiness from, um, from the sort of historical Humphrey and look at him in the round. And then I think at the end, you know, I do have a letter right at the end where um, we are asked by one of Humphrey's oldest friends to kind of love him warts and all. And in a way that's mm -hmm. the point that I, I have come to as, as, as the granddaughter slash writer. And that's, I, I hope, the point that the reader also arrives at, that I really don't want it to be a book in which judgments are made necessarily. Mm. Um, everybody can draw their own conclusions and like or dislike them if that's how they respond to the book. But that was something that I um, didn't feel I needed to do myself. It wasn't really about how I felt about him. It was how I wanted to represent him um, as allowing him his own words in which he does rather damn himself, but also trying to contextualize him a little bit so that he could be understood better. I think you do contextualize him. And I think one of the aspects of the book that's so interesting is um, the way kind of, you know, women are, um, emerging and what it is to be a clever woman. I mean, Elizabeth Bone's so interesting about that, isn't she? You know, mm. she she says to Humphrey sometimes, you know, there's a letter, isn't there, where she says, I am a man. I think she says something like, don't don't think of me in this particular regard as a woman, you know, I am a, I am a man. Mm. And I think that that's so interesting. And, and in terms of your grandfather, I, I do think he's terribly honest and that's very modern. You know, mm. he's his mm. views may not be to our liking, but he does look mm. out for her, doesn't he? Mm. But but what about this um, pickle, if you like, that women of that, clever women of that age found themselves in? And what did she mean when she said, you know, think of me as a man in this regard? Well, I do think, I mean, she, she looks at this quite a lot because she talks about her sort of domineering behavior, but there's one, I think, really revealing um, bit between the two of them where, um, Humphrey says to Elizabeth, you know, you know, I, I don't like your demonstrative behavior. And she replies, what you see as demonstrative, I see as spontaneity. And I think that absolutely sums it up between the different ways that she talks about having a big personality. That was a problem for the men that she was around. It wasn't a problem for her. She mm -hmm. measured her gin in inches. She was a good time girl. Can you tell us a little bit about where your um, grandmother came into um, the picture, as it were, sort of, you know, who, who came first? Um, I think when I started writing the book, I was really so gripped and overawed by the letters. I thought they were going to be the book. But then I realised that um, the letters talked about Madeline an enormous amount. And as I then read other letters, family letters between Humphrey and Madeline, Elizabeth was cropping up in those letters. So it really became something that she needed to be in. Um, when, when I then decided to allow her a bigger role was when I realized that after the end of the affair between Humphrey and Madeline, which is quite a short affair, there were letters in the 40s and 50s, and I wanted to sort of look at the broad sweep of, of those years. And Madeline was kind of the glue that held the war section together. And in that bit, she 
um, we get some of her letters for the first time. And I think that by allowing her to start writing letters about her daily life in the war and bringing up her children, um, I wanted to introduce another voice into the second half of the narrative so that by the end of it, each of the three characters has had um, their section of the book, as it were. And in a way, I wanted her to, um, she's an interesting literary figure in her own right. Um, you know, the, the transition from being the pitied, wronged wife to being um, this dynamic literary woman who um, has a real sort of steely determination in her 25 years of editing Dickens's letters. You know, it, it is in a way um, her book at the end, uh, even though when you begin it, it, it certainly isn't. Um, and I think the contrast between the two women is fascinating. And that's what you were talking about earlier, Genevieve, about the two women and about the sort of sexual politics of the 1930s and 40s. You know, here are two women who have family commitments, but who are both really committed to their lives as sort of artists and literary figures and all of the sort of balances and compromises that they have to deal with. She's Madeline's pretty extraordinary, isn't she? Because she um, she knows of the um, friendship and then the affair between um, Humphrey. She knows about um, Elizabeth um, as a force or presence in, in, in Humphrey's life when they are engaged and their engagement is sort of on off, isn't it? And so when she enters into the marriage to Humphrey, mm -hmm. um, you know, there is a third person in the marriage, isn't there? And she, uh, once or twice, I think Humphrey writes to her and, and at one stage he, he, he actually says to her, I think it's to her that she's like furniture or the dark. Mm -hmm. And then later in their relationship, when she's, as you say, you know, emerged as the person who's really strong and steady and a devoted mother and a very strong woman, she writes to him and, you know, says, you know, please do not describe me as furniture again. And then it's sort of enough said because she's emerging, isn't she? Absolutely. And I think that that her emergence is one of the things I don't want to spoil the end of the book, but it was certainly a pleasing thing to write. And not that wasn't something that I knew. I really didn't know where the book was going to end. It was only when I read these other letters that I realised what a strong voice and what a funny um, and resilient person she was. Um, and so that's why I thought that her much more human and humorous and normal letters were a really nice balance with to the Humphrey letters and the Elizabeth letters, which were certainly a little bit more um, self-conscious. There's a moment, isn't there, when um, your grandfather and um, uh, and your grandmother are getting married, and um, uh, your grandmother's met Elizabeth um, by now. Can you tell us um, what she sent by way of a sort of wedding? Um, acknowledgement. Well, if you a, a tea service, I mean, a more insulting present for someone to be sent, you know, to be sent something which is just a reminder of that you are the little wife. Um, but um, I think the, um, the the gifts are an interesting one because I think the more the more important one was the photograph that she sent to them. And um, can you to, describe that? It's a portrait of, uh, of Elizabeth wearing a, um, wearing a dress with decorative buttons, a quite, a quite a harsh portrait, black and white, slight profile. And it is the most extraordinary thing if you're sending um, the, a couple who are getting married, one of whom you're having an affair with, a photograph of yourself. So <laughs> where is she meant to, where are, the, where are the new happy couple meant to put this photograph in a drawer? On the mantelpiece. Um, so you know the, the 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 physical presence of Elizabeth in that marriage is sort of very is, is symbolised by this black and white photograph that that she sent them, which was in its original envelope. So you know it was really quite quite wonderful feeling to sort of take that out and and realise that that was the photograph that she had sent him just at that point when he was getting married. The, the thing about objects is interesting. It's interesting thinking about you handling those letters and also of that photograph that you're just describing 
and objects as well as place are so important to Bowen, aren't they? Um, and you yourself talk about at one stage, um, you talk about, I think it's, um, I think it's place thinking. Place um, feeling. Place, place feeling. feeling, yeah. And yeah. I just wondered what your relationship was with place kind of going through the book and if you can tell us a little bit of why you went where you went. Well, place feeling is another is another thing I've stolen from Elizabeth. It's her phrase, not mine. I need to uh, okay. hold up my hand. But in a way, if, I, if we're thinking about the three things that that Bowen gave me for this book, they were the letters, they were the idea of ghosts and the connections with the past, and there is her obsession with sense of place. Mm. And she talks about um, she's always on the lookout for places where things have happened because they give her a kind of vicarious excitement. And I thought, well, that is an invitation to travel to all of these places and actually to, to sort of tap into a physical archive as, a, as well as a literary and epistolary one and actually think about those, those places and engage with the place myself. And so I very much did. I, lay, I laid out all of the letters and then I thought, great, this is great. I'm going to India in February or I'm going to Ireland in the summer. And I wanted my way of responding to the material to be a, a, about a journey so that there were different journeys going on in the book. And my, my traveling to these places was just one of them. So that it wasn't necessarily what I found out, but it was just a remapping of the relationship and the re and their history, really. Because of course your grandfather goes at one stage, for those who haven't read the book, he, he goes when I think your aunt has been born, he goes to take up a teaching post in um, Calcutta. Mm. Um, and there are some very, there's some very kind of interesting letters then. And that's when we see your, um, we see your grandmother really kind of holding the fort at home. But, but Madeline doesn't stay at home, does she? Even after no. she's had um, her second child, your mother. No, no, my, my, my uh, grandmother, in fact, she, she dashes off to India for six yeah. months, um, um, living the high life and, you know, going out dancing on, um, you know, having a grand old time going up into the Himalayas um, and leaving her two small children behind. And I think nowadays we think, oh my goodness, that's a terrible thing to do. She just thought, no, I was born, she was born in, in Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and she wanted to go back, so why not? And I think that sort of spirit of adventure um, really starts coming through. But yes, that, that, that sort of central section of the book, the Calcutta chapters, are a real sort of shift um, where, and it also is a major um, shift in Bowen's life because that's the end of her Oxford years. She moves up to London, she buys her lovely house with views of Regent's Park, and she becomes much more a figure in London. So there are transitions for, for all of the characters at that point. And so it, it was quite a useful way for me to allow everybody to move on, even though they were you know, in, still in touch with one another, but much to a much lesser e extent. She, she's quite bossy, Elizabeth, isn't she? When um, Humphrey starts writing to her from Calcutta and she seems to want to tell him how to write his letters, doesn't yeah. she? Yeah, she does. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, your last letter I naturally discounted, you know. Yes. She's, she's, she's very much that sort of person. And then she says things like, you know, if I were a prima donna, I would throw chairs around. You know, why can't you be more more um, amenable or malleable. So yes, she really did like getting her own way, but I think that that was partly because she talks about this. She, she says to him, you know, um, I like being able to manipulate people just like I can manipulate characters in my books. And I think that this whole friction about, you know, where, where is, where the control and power is and how much control you can exert over a real person and how much you, you can exert over a fictional person it was kind of a really interesting friction for her. And meanwhile, uh, let's not forget that um, she also had Alan, her husband, um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say in the background, I'm not quite sure how to, to phrase it, but I know that you write that after he, he died, that um, she said that Bowen's court was her next of kin. Mm -hmm. And 
that makes me think, of course, of of Madeline, who went on to have three children. Um, mm -hmm. And there was Elizabeth, who uh, was not very accommodating, shall we say, when she discovers that um, that your grandmother is pregnant. I mean, what do we learn about Bowen and motherhood and children and family and so forth? Does your opinion of her sort of shift? I think this is one of the most interesting things about the correspondence is looking at her as a woman who up until she met Humphrey, she was in her early 30s. She hadn't really entertained the thought of motherhood, partly because of the kind of companionate marriage she had with Alan Cameron, but also because she wanted to write. But I do think being reminded of, of Madeline's um, pregnancy did bring up an awful lot of, you know, contradictory and complex feelings for Elizabeth, and she didn't know quite where to put those. So she does have, um, on the one hand, she has a moment of real jealousy towards Madeline, and then she says, you know, I'm working quite hard to like her. Can't you see, you know, we actually get on all right. Mm. So, you know, I do think that she has these really, you know, her, her feelings really fluctuate as far as Madeline, come, that Madeline is concerned. Um, and, um, but I do think that, it's, that it really does throw an in interesting light on her and her feeling of like rootlessness. And particularly when Alan goes, that is just a completely heartbreaking letter. The one where you talk about her saying that her next of kin is the house, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then, of course, she sold the house and it was knocked down. And then she really was spiritually homeless mm -hmm. um, at the end of her life. Mm -hmm. For, yeah, for somebody who was so kind of rooted to where they lived, because they lived for this, at this for quite a long time in the same house in Regent's Park, didn't they, when mm -hmm. they were in London? I mean, that is one of the very kind of moving and surprising aspects of the book, because we mm -hmm. get so used to this inviolable, um, feisty, fierce, and of course, very sort of funny woman. Um, so it, it's, it, is, it is particularly um, sad. Mm -hmm. Thinking about houses, I wonder whether we might talk about the kind of the oeuvre as a whole. I mean, you know, I think probably her most famous novel, would it be fair to say, is The House in Paris? Well, a lot of people would say it's the heat of the day. It's her wartime okay. novel. So, but I, I'm a great, I, I think that her great work in terms of her novels is the 1930s. And then I think her wartime short stories are but that's my that's my personal preference. Obviously, for the book, the most important of her novels is The House in Paris, because that is the one that she was writing at the time of the affair. That's the one that has got a dis dysfunctional love triangle at the centre. Um, and, you know, it's tempting to look at that novel and say, gosh, are these versions of um, of my grandparents and certainly that's the story that I grew up with I mean I've got an old paperback version of the house in Paris and inside is written Max is supposed to be based on Humphrey House so this idea of these characters being my grandparents was something I inherited and in a way I've had to try and unlearn that and look at the book uh, with a little bit more detachment than, uh, than I inherited. Are there any clues in the in the title? Oh, I think so, don't you? I mean, <laughs> Only you know, when it was pointed out. <laughs> the house in Paris. I mean, yes, I mean, it could have been called, you know, something completely different. Mrs. Fisher and her daughter. Mrs. Si Mrs. Fisher and her sickly daughter, it could have been called, but it's not. Or Madame Fisher, sorry. Um, and I don't know. I think it could have been. Obviously, he has got a great, uh, e uh, easy to use surname. I mean, what was... The, the last laugh in terms of the house in Paris is Madeleine, because at the end of the book, she identifies as Naomi, who is the sort of rather um, drippy uh, woman who is rejected and who doesn't get the man. And um, Madeleine sort of says, yeah, I was Naomi. I was like the pillow, which is how she is described in the book. Um, because he needed a pillow when Elizabeth came bounding into his life. And so this whole idea of her imagining that she is a character in the book um, was a really interesting thing, that that was the, her version, maybe a way of dealing with the relationship, fictionalising it for herself, 
in order to make it more bearable. Who knows? Very interesting what you said at the beginning about her keeping um, the letters um, between Elizabeth and Humphrey. Do you think in terms of posterity, she was thinking about the family heritage or was this an act of love, do you think, for her husband? This is such a good, such a good question. I know that some letters, I know she burnt some letters. Um, how many of the Bowen correspondence got destroyed, I don't know, but there is a gap of nearly a year right at the beginning of the, of the affair. So we have to assume, knowing that Elizabeth was writing hundreds of letters a year, that there were letters that had gone. Now why she, there are a couple of ones where Elizabeth is sort of on top form and I do think that Madeline, she, she won. We must remember that Humphrey did not leave her. And she probably thought, oh yeah, these are good letters. Or she had other things to be getting on with and they were in a box somewhere. And she, like many people, you chuck them in the attic and forget about them. So I, I don't think that, it, from, from Madeline's later correspondence, it doesn't look as though, um, she spent years agonizing about this. Indeed, when Victoria Glendinning came to um, ask Madeline about it, she couldn't find the letters. <laughs> she looked in all of the she looked in all of the usual places and then had to look in the unusual ones in order to find them. So I don't think that she spent 40 years, mm. you know, devastated by this. She just got on with her life and saw it as something in the past. Mm. Well, she definitely is such a kind of attractive and strong person. That seems really, uh, really um, plausible to me. The book is very scholarly and, and full of rigorous uh, research, but not everybody you talk to is necessarily a kind of, you know, uh, scholarly person. I quite like that moment of inspiration you got when you were in Spain and found yourself having to um, go and see a chiropractor. Yeah. What happened there? Well, I was I was dancing at a fiesta um, in northern Spain. I fell over. It was in a field. Um, and the thing to do when you fall over in a field and twist your ankle is to stop dancing. But of course, I didn't. I continued dancing. And by the end of the evening, I had a proper full on broken ankle and it was just really horrible. So I started going to see a chiropractor and and she was more than that. And she was I was talking to her about my um, about my grandmother and about what happened. And she really saw the um, the idea that sort of traumas and griefs and angers skip generations and the very fact that my injured leg was the injured leg it was tied in with my mother's side of the family all this was a little bit too much for me to bear but the idea I was but I was I was really taken with the idea of this some kind of physical connection that that if griefs are buried just like mm -hmm. if letters are put in the attic mm -hmm. they are going to come out at some point um, and so when she said, you know, it, it's, it's, there's a great line in Spanish, estás comiendo la vida de, de tu abuela, you are eating your grandmother's life. It's such a vivid way of, you know, digesting anew your family history and of course, you know, bringing it out in a different form. Absolutely. It's one of my favourite, favourite lines in what, is, in what is a kind of dazzling, dazzling book that has such breadth. And I can tell I'm looking at the questions now and uh, there are quite a few there. So if I may, we'll just turn to, okay. to those questions. I'll, I'll read them as yeah. they're here on my screen. So we have yeah. a question from Rupert Christensen, The Shadowy Third. But what about the even more shadowy fourth, Alan Cameron? How much do you think he knew about what was going on? I think that he he turned a, a blind eye. He was extremely supportive of Elizabeth's um, professional life. He also had his own life, um, both working for the BBC and working um, in sort of education um, council for, for Oxfordshire when they were there. Um, I think later in life, uh, he it's no secret that he had a little bit of a drink problem. So one wonders whether um, there were other things that took up a little bit more of his time than might have otherwise. 
The thing about Elizabeth and, and, and her relationship with him was they were fiercely loyal to one another, but allowed, an, a, a, allowed each other an enormous amount of space. And to come back to that question is about, is he the shadowy fourth? In a way, I think he could be because she really almost never mentions him in the letters. And there's one point where um, she's writing to Humphrey, Elizabeth is writing to Humphrey and, has, and just says, Alan has come into the room and therefore I must stop now. And I just felt that as, you know, she was a great one for compartmentalizing her life. And she compartmentalized her life with Alan. They went to Bowen's court for Christmas. They threw a, they threw a huge party for all the neighbors. She had, a very, she had very clear parameters for her married life and was fiercely loyal to the institution of marriage. Um, but I think that he got on with his own things. He had his own part of the house and he had his own friends and his own job. Mm, it's really interesting, isn't it? That loyalty does really come across mm. in the book. Thank you. So a question from um, Maury Birdway. Has writing this book changed how you felt about your family and about yourself? Um, definitely about my family. I think just because knowledge, knowing so much about um, about my past now, uh, I, I feel incredibly fortunate to have um, to, I think, remarkable people as my grandparents. I don't want necessarily to say that it's changed me as a person. I don't think it has. It, it has made me a writer, and that is a huge gift. I mean, goodness me, if I come from literary stock and I have now written a book, then that is the most wonderful um, heritage, I think. So, yes, that's the biggest change that has happened to me through doing this. Okay, and also for Maury, is it possible that the shadowy third of the title might be your inclusion in the story as the author and granddaughter? Ah, interesting. Well, yes, I mean, I could be, yes, I could be. I, I think there are, there are many people, I'm delighted that different people are identifying different people as the shadowy third or the shadowy fourth, um, because that, that really means that, I mean, certainly some people have said, um, even Elizabeth is the shadowy third, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the book. If people see me as the shadowy third, that's great. I think I might be a little bit too loud to be shadowy, but you can judge that when you read the book. <laughs> that can be your autobiography, too loud to be shadowy. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Jill Nichols says, Genevieve said early, let's talk about sex, but then you both got sidetracked. Was there <laughs> more you would have wanted to say? Well, I think I'm going to have to say read the book because there's yeah. a really there's a really great scene in the middle of the book, which is about Elizabeth's attitude to to sex, which I think was problematic to her. It was not an easy um, an easy topic, and it was it was something that um, certainly was an something that she was awkward about. Um, both with Humphrey and in in the scene that I'm describing, which was when um, when she had a house party at Bowen's Court, and let's just say it went disastrously wrong. Mm. Yes, that's a good that's a good intrigue intrigue kind of hook there. And then here we have congratulations on this wonderful book by somebody whose name is spelled E O I N, and I'm sorry, I don't know how you pronounce that. Um, there are numerous narrative strands in this book that are beautifully interwoven together. Can you describe the editorial process? To what extent did the structure of the book evolve over time? Mm. And was the involvement of Matt, your editor, key to that? Um, I think when I, when I took it to Matt, the structure was pretty much set. I do have various friends who were incredibly helpful in terms of um, helping with the structure. And one person in particular suggested um, I had said, you know, I was thinking about uh, having some first person and having a travelogue. And um, I, some of some people will know Robert Crompton, who uh, is a very good friend of mine. And he said, well, why don't you have have a little bit of travelogue or something at the beginning of every chapter like you were thinking? But why don't you put it in first person? And so his idea to actually make my my story one which were, was short, succinct, really pithy and and very present was incredibly helpful because I 
it made me really focus on what it was that I was trying to say in that chapter beginning. As far as the rest of it was, I really tried to balance it out, saying, OK, I've got a thousand words of letters in this chapter. I can't have any more. And then I was thinking, OK, so I, I did look at it at the end. That came quite late, looking at the balance. At the beginning, I had way too many letters and they they badly needed cutting. So whole letters disappeared and you know, the book is better for it. Um, but I, I, I knew early on that I was going to shift back and forth because that was what interested me about, about the process of writing it. Great. So one question is um, very pointed, but which of the three is the shadowy third? Oh gosh. I can't make that decision for you. You're the readers. That's the joy of reading, surely. Uh, I know in my mind who I think the shadowy third is, but I think again here, you see, I have stolen this title from Elizabeth, of course, and um, you have to go and read her short story and then you'll know the answer to that question. Okay. A uh, question here from Helen uh, Elliott. I'm wondering how well Julia knew her grandmother, given that she didn't know her grandfather at all. What impression did she give to her young granddaughter, who of course you actually knew? Mm. Um, we visited my grandmother when um, we were children. My grandmother died when I was about 12. I remember her chain smoking and working on Dickens letters in her study. Um, very dry sense of humor. I was always in trouble in her house. I do remember that. So she did seem quite fierce to me. Um, but I do, I do her, her sense of humor was something I remember, but also that, that feeling that somebody he's got an important job to do. <laughs> and the fact that she was continuing working on the Dickens letters well into her 70s meant that she, you know, she wasn't really a grandmother who, who, who was out in the garden, you know, playing cricket with us. Uh, that doesn't mean she wasn't loving, but I didn't have a close relationship. And that was also partly because my parents lived overseas. So I didn't see her on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, so Pablo Lacal says, personal material of artists can often shape our understanding and view of their work when we go back to them, better for better or worse. Did Bones' correspondence in any way reveal or recontextualize any aspects of her writing or help you enjoy it in a different way? Um, yes, I think, I, I think now when I read her fiction, I can't not think about a corresponding letter or something that has echoes in other stuff that I have read. I think maybe I will need a break from Bowen for a while because, because that overlap between the fiction, um, the non-fiction, of course, which is also incredibly interesting, and the letters has been so complete for me that that. I do need to sort of separate them out. I, I now think that whenever I take Bowen into the classroom, which I still do, and I know there are some of my pupils who have, who have um, had me coming in and saying, great, we're going to do the demon lover today, which is of course my favorite Bowen ghost story. Um, I can't teach it without this huge feeling of gratitude and um, for, for in a way what she has given me, not just about this book, but also as a teacher, as somebody who loves literature. So all, of, all those strands, I think, of my, of my being are woven into, into this book. Great. So we have mentioned here of uh, another Elizabeth. Elizabeth Taylor said that only three people in her life could do no wrong, her mm. housekeeper, her butcher, and Elizabeth Bowen. Do you understand why some people felt like that about Elizabeth Bowen? Yes, it's really interesting. I, when I went to the archive in, um, in Austin, Texas, there was a whole folder of correspondence from Elizabeth Taylor, um, who was no a novelist and short story writer of mostly the, you know, the, the 50s and 60s. So this is very much the end of, towards the end of Bowen's life. She died in 73. But the fierce loyalty that um, as a friend, everybody said that Elizabeth was an extraordinary friend. Yes, she could dump people overnight, but in terms of sticking with people, she really had your bag. And so I do think that that idea of somebody who, who really could be relied on in that sort of way was something, it, it, it's one of her loveliest qualities as a friend, definitely. 
Well, somebody's asked an interesting question. What would you have wanted to discuss or ask about if you had the possibility of meeting Elizabeth? If she could have been your friend, perhaps? Goodness me, that's such a good, it's a very good question. Mm. Um, well, I, I think we would have had a whiskey sour to start with. I mean, that was always a good place to start with Elizabeth. A whiskey sour would be a good start. I think, I think, um, the interesting thing about her is even though she was a performer, there was, you know, her, her, um, she, there, there were sort of, there was a sort of nervousness about her, about her physical presence. And she had a, she had a slight, um, a slight stammer as well. And so, you know, we, you, you, you would have this sort of, you know, big personality, but I think if I, if, if I was going to talk about something, um, I think it would have to be about about place, really, about all of those places that she went to where she had that sense of something magical happening. You know, what top three places, Elizabeth, has that happened to you in? Maybe something mm -hmm. along those lines. Mm, yeah, that would be a great question. OK, so we have um, Max saying it sounds like your research took you down a number of unexpected paths, fun digressions, intellectual, geographical. What were the most rewarding or stimulating or interesting of any of these? Again, I guess if you had to pick. Um, I'm going for Calcutta for the simple reason that it made me appraise Humphrey totally, totally new. I think that when I went there and they knew who Humphrey House was and they didn't know who Elizabeth Bowen was, I, 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 it was an most extraordinary readjustment and to see um, a satirical pamphlet that he wrote about police surveillance in Calcutta in the 1930s being republished this year or last year. Um, and just having to look at him through a completely new lens. Um, that to what, you know, that in terms of how I looked at the material differently. And also, you know, just, just the sheer excitement of, of going to Calcutta and meeting people who were interested in my grandfather was a really extraordinary experience. There was a lovely moment when you go to an, a bookshop and I think it's a secondhand bookshop and yeah, yeah. you mention Elizabeth Bowen, he doesn't know who that is. And then you say Humphrey House and he's like, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> he says, I think I've got two titles for you. Yeah. Okay, so one question here from Nick. Were you inspired by any other um, biographies of, of other writers um, in your own approach or...? <laughs> because I, um, I, I like historical biographies very much of literary figures, but I think I was more, in, more inspired by other sort of mixed genre narratives. You know, if you look at works like, I don't know, someone like Robert McFarlane's The Old Ways, which is partly a book about Edward Thomas's poetry and it's partly a book about landscape and it's partly a, a book about long distance walking. So I was more interested possibly or influenced by those kinds of um, those kind of books, those ones which are having some literary, some serious literary content, but mixing it in with other things. And I do think that at the moment there's a real, there's a real sort of fashion for these kind of books that is that are doing a little bit of many things, which is why mine is both half a biography and half a memoir, because I just think that there are more of them around and, and readers enjoy them. Mm. Gosh, you know, there are so many more questions. I don't think we've got time for too many more. So there's there's a question here um, congratulating you, of course, on the book and saying she'd love to hear more about the ghosts and the kind of eerie in, in the book. Well, the eeriness is... <sighs> The eeriness is an interesting one because I do I don't feel as though I saw necessarily there, there were a couple of times when I did feel I sort of felt ghosts but I do think that whether you whether it is a physical sensation or whether it is some kind of feeling that you might have in a dream or whether you're you're just conscious that there is a ghost there even if you can't communicate with it I mean I think that certainly when I went to Ireland um, and went to the, the ruins of Bowen's court which is just such a sort of sad, um, such a sad sight. There, you just felt that there was so much history sort of seeping, um, it, well, through my boots, literally. Um, and the, the sense that you have this sort of interpenetration of past and present everywhere in her work just felt like such a, a sort of potent, um, 
um, opportunity for me to have that kind of, of, of link as well. All right, so one more question, our last question, goodness. Uh, ah, final <laughs> question. <laughs> what do you think would be Elizabeth's feelings and thoughts about the book? Oh, I don't know. She, li she liked being the center of attention, so I'm sure she'd be thrilled with the cover. Um, I, I hope that she would like it. I, I think that there are, there are passages in it where, um, well, she's, her writing is gorgeous. She was very aware of her own contradictions. So I don't think the fact that my portrayal of her is contradictory and, you know, you know she see, we see so many different sides of her personality would come as any surprise. And she had, you know, she had a good sense of humour. She was able to take things with a pinch of salt and a large, a large gin and tonic. Brilliant. On that note, let me hand over to Hazel. Julia, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. That was so interesting and such fabulous questions. And I think we could all listen a lot longer, but we can't because we have to make time for Matt to um, say a few words and to propose a toast to, to Julia. Matt, over to you. Hi, everyone. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is really such an honor because it's a book that Julie and I have been working on. It's a labor of love. Um, I was just, I was so impressed with the book when it came to me via her agent. And uh, I mean, Caroline, I think knows that I love women's voices, especially from history that gets to contextualize social history and, and bring someone sort of out of the shadows. And as much as Elizabeth Bowen was this just huge novelist in the 20th century, I feel like people today might not necessarily know who she is. And so as I was reading through this book, I just thought, oh, this is the introduction this era needs to know more about Elizabeth because she's just, she just jumps off the page and she is phenomenal. Um, warts and all. And, and I think that is another element of the biography slash memoir because we really were discussing, you know, what is this book? And is it memory, uh, memoir? Is it biography? And we, at the end of the day, we said, does it have to be either? Uh, it's, it's mixed genre uh, and it's so much stronger for it. And uh, one of the things I, I just absolutely love about the book is that you have these present day asides with Julia where she's taking you on this sort of this journey of a rediscovery. And to my mind, it was just so visual. And I could see this being adapted to a BBC documentary very easily where you go into the letters and into the past. And then you're with Julia who's you know, describing everything today. And you know, this is the site where uh, you know, so and so was saying such and such, and um, yeah, I just, I just thought it just came together so brilliantly. Um, so, and I'm, I mean, the reviews have been just incredible in the press, and I, I cannot be more thankful for all the people who have been just so loving and supporting of this book. Um, the other thing I should say is I, I was definitely looking for Julia's other books that she had published when I saw the manuscript because I thought there's no way that this person has a debut author because she's just the the prose are just so beautiful and um as much as you know there's elizabeth bowen which is you know the first hook um to get into the book and then after that there's this just phenomenal uh, story and and you know a bit of scandal literary scandal i just love that myself um but what keeps me going throughout the whole book is just knowing that I'm in such capable hands with, with an author. And that's what really sold me on this book. And I thought, if nobody loves Elizabeth Bowen, it doesn't matter, they're gonna love Julia. So um, any, and if, if you haven't already bought the book, I'm just going to hold it up here and show you in its, all its lovely glory. Uh, it's, it's a really, really gorgeous book that uh, we put together and just gorgeous end papers that we put together on there as well. And, uh, and there's integrated photos, um, you know, from, from Julia's private collection. So you get to see these just amazing photos that will really bring you into the time and the place. Um, so 
I, the other thing I should mention is uh, support your local business, support small business. So tonight our um, event has been put on by Village Books and Shirleywood Books and Seven Oaks Books, and they uh, exclusively have signed copies available. So you can't get signed copies anywhere else. They're only available to these three fantastic independent bookshops who I'm so thankful are hosting us tonight because they do an amazing event every time. Um, so I really highly recommend that you go and buy the book from them. And uh, and I would just like to, I, I've, I've drunk most of my gin and tonic at this point, but I would, <laughs> I would like to, um, everyone hold up a glass. In, oh, you know, my, in, my glass is coming, my glass is coming. Oh, your glass is coming, okay, okay, ah, excellent. There we go, there we go. I, well, yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to say thank you so much, Julia. It's been fantastic to work with you on this book and there's so much more work to do, of course. Uh, we're only on the first day of publication uh, at the launch, but cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 <laughs> All the very best. Oh, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so, so much, everybody. It was, uh, it was uh, such an interesting evening. So good. And as Matt says, Hazel and I and Fleur have very beautiful books signed, um, which is, you know, really special in this day and age. <laughs> Thank you so much for arranging that. And we have them at the shop. So please, if you didn't didn't um, book one with your ticket, then um, here's your chance to, to buy them from our shops. So Genevieve, thank you so much for um, taking us through this evening. So, um, so with such um, uh, ease and so interestingly, and uh, Julia, it was just so interesting. Lovely to, to sort of meet you and get to know you on the screen <laughs> like this. Thank and you. make the book come alive even more. So thank you. And thank you, Hazel, for, for hosting. So um, yes, what a brilliant evening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well done, Julia. <laughs> thank you. It was lovely. Thank you so much. <laughs> right.